Nobody showed up in the other room. Wow, everybody got the message. Yay. All right, so we are live. Nobody showed up in the other room. Live on YouTube. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to the July meeting of Palomar Amateur Radio Club. I'll get our flag up here and we will say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the Hands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, that was the original one. Missed the under God. All right. Did you know that there is no comma after nation? Everybody yes. does it wrong. They no, all say everybody. nation, I comma, under God, comma. There is no comma there. It's one nation under God, one phrase. Okay. And you'll never hear anybody but me do it. I run out of breath at that point. That's not true. I do also <laughs> do it correctly. Sorry. Okay, uh, so we have uh, any visitors first time here? I think I recognize everybody. Uh, Thomas, okay. Everybody seems to know, or a couple people seem to know you. So go ahead and Thomas and give us an intro. Uh, hi, my name is Thomas. I'm a freshman studying aerospace engineering at SDSU. I got my radios technician's license when I was in the eighth grade, and I did my science fair project on that that year and had a good time with that. Great. Um, I was also a Boy Scout and worked with the, or did the um, Scout Net every week on the uh, Park 73 repeater. Awesome. And what area are you from? I'm from Mare Mesa. Okay. Great. Uh, are you going to... Are you either already active back in scouting or going to be active back in scouting and leadership in any form? Uh, yes, I came back to my troop as a um, assistant scoutmaster, but um, my troop dissolved shortly after with uh, COVID. All right. Uh, do you yes, know? I do plan to stay active. All right, good. So, so you know Kev, um, Kevin then, right? Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Charlie, good. do you want to introduce Tom? I was going to ask, uh, are we going to make sure that we uh, welcome him? Well, go for it, Charlie. Tell everyone I, who he is. I will go ahead and mention to everybody that Thomas is the recipient of our 2021 scholarship. And he's from San Diego. So we finally got a San Diego student. Um, with one of our scholarships. And uh, we welcomed him to the club and made him a um, member um, with his, with the award of his scholarship. And it's a pleasure to see you, uh, Mark. Where'd you, I mean, Thomas, where'd you go? Oh, you shifted. So uh, welcome to Palomar. Thank you Great. so very much. All right. Um, anybody else first time? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, so apparently it's Thomas. Charlie's first time. Yeah. He, he had his hand up. Oh, um, Thomas, are you going to upgrade your license? Uh, yes, I hope to upgrade soon to the general class. I got to get some studying on, on that. Um, I just finished up my summer school. Actually, I did a uh, summer session, so I'll have a bit more time for that. Great. Um, keep an eye out. Uh, Jay Goldberg does classes for uh, technician general and extra, um, and they're great. I, that's what I did to get my general and my extra. So, Charlie, did you have something else? No. Okay. Hi, Joe, I do. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Joe. you all know Tom, I-E-T. Yeah. Lord. Yeah, well, he's back in the hospital again, just so you will know. Okay. Then... Uh, He's in Tri-Cities in room 485. He'll be there for a little while. He has various things that are happening, but he's cheerful and uh, and uh, positive about everything, but he's just going to be probably in the hospital for a while. Do they let him have an HT? 
They let him have an HT, but his room is facing the wrong way. He can't get through the walls. He can hear, but he cannot transmit. Mm. And that I is know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. If anybody wants to stop by and see him, uh, that'd be neat. I'm correct in that problem. Thanks for that info, John. You bet. Yeah, I heard that on the repeater this morning. All right. Uh, well, that this is the announcement section, so. Um, my announcements are from the scope, which uh, include the fact that we are having a picnic. That's the last uh, weekend in September, so it's a little little ways away yet. Um, but that will more information on that. So it's September 25th, normal location, San Diego Park area four. Uh, so we'll have more information specifics on what to bring and, and everything in uh, future newsletters. Um, and hope everybody had fun field daying. And uh, remember, if you haven't submitted your logs yet, you can submit them with your own call sign under W6NWG, and Palmer gets the points. And let's see, uh, coming back to in person, we haven't, the board hasn't set a firm date yet. Um, we want to make sure that we have everything lined up to keep the remote people who aren't going to come back in person supported. Um, so I have done some testing and we're going to continue to do more testing of the equipment that we have uh, to make sure that the experience is uh, quality in person and quality on the uh, Zoom call. If we go Zoom or YouTube or however, we're going to uh, deal with those who aren't actually at the meeting space. I know that uh, COVID has given given everybody the ability to sit on their couch, Doug, and attend meetings. <laughs> um, and a lot of people are going to have a hard time going back. And a lot of people really want to go back to in-person meetings. So um, we, we need to be conscious of that and support uh, everybody, um, whichever way they, they decide to go. So I... A it's really a very fancy virtual background. Uh huh. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, the DX Club had their first meeting um, week before last. That combination meeting, like we're talking about doing, and the the only so we we projected the a, a video of well this video on uh, on the screen, and the only problem with the whole thing was that the people at home could not hear each of the individual speakers that were in the room. So they've bought a wireless microphone, but I think we're covered with that by the, in that realm. But that's something we'll want to do is possibly have a, a wireless microphone to pass around if we have a round table kind of thing or have someone asking questions. Okay, good, good input, Glenn. Thanks for that. Um, John, go ahead, uh, Quivenin. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, remind people, uh, co three or three months ago or so, they put an ad in the scope for uh, some oscilloscopes and uh, Yesu 757 and a uh, bunch of books and cables and things of that nature that were donated to the club. And I've still got the vast majority of the stuff. So if you look back over, I think, uh, uh, March or February uh, scopes, uh, you'll see a list of stuff that's for sale. Uh, I'm still trying to find good homes for it. Maybe if we have the uh, October auction, we, <coughs> excuse me, maybe if we have the October auction, uh, we can find even better homes for it. Okay. I have an announcement. Um, I I'm going to, I'm gonna. I got you, Charlie. I'm gonna tail on uh, on John there since he mentioned the auction. Uh, we are having the auction. It will be the first Saturday or first, first Saturday, first Wednesday of uh, October, as usual. Uh, it will be at the um, Harding um, Community Center building, not the Pine Avenue uh, facility. Uh, same place we've had it previous years for the auction. Uh, just note that slight location change from the regular meeting. Uh, location is we need the larger room. Uh, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say um, I invite everybody who is listening, if you know somebody who has a program or a matter of interest 
that we could present as a program, including one of you, let me know because it's getting pretty hard to find new stuff. Now, if you want to listen to how you build a dipole, you have plenty of those, but um, interesting stuff is getting hard to find. <clears throat> All right, good. Yep. Call for content. And uh, of course, with everything being virtual right now, uh, it's easy to do people from anywhere. I'm not sure if we'd want to bring in a, a virtual presenter when we're uh, back in person, that might not uh, be the best experience for the for the in person group, but we can entertain that possibility. Um, so yeah, and meetings don't have to be presented by professional speakers by any means you know any club member who is working on a cool project uh talk to charlie talk to me talk to any of the board members and uh even if it's not if you have something that you can talk about for 15 minutes we can do yeah. uh, multiple presentations in one meeting you don't have to take up a full hour so great uh any other announcements questions comments Nope. Okay. Uh, so this brings us to the reports section, repeater site and technical. Mark, do you want to talk to us about our repeaters? Well, let's see. The repeaters are all behaving themselves well. We still uh, have the issue of, with the exception of wires X, I guess I can, uh, I can pull up the image for wires X since I did it once already. So there's the Wires X control screen, which looks all well and wonderful, except that this part right here where you're actually supposed to be talking to somebody and this says local and it's not blinking or doing anything. Um, there's a little tiny thing down here in red that says that it can't talk to the interface, which I'm looking at the interface right now and it's working fine. And the computer talks to it and initializes the radio, which just for some reason, it doesn't think it works. So that was going to be part of tonight's discussion, but not anymore. And the uh, so that's repeater technical chair. The other thing that's really important, I need a lot of help, guys. Uh, a gentleman who has long time been associated with the club many years ago lives up in Arcadia. And he's giving us his tower. Uh, if you guys want to see, it's a U.S. Tower 572, which is a 1,500-pound, uh, 72-foot electric crank-up and crank-down tower. Uh, Glenn and I went up to see it last weekend. It's in great shape. And all we have to do, it's on the mountain right near the site. We've got to get it 1,800 feet from where it is to our site. We'll worry about building another uh, base for it later. But uh, I need, as I say, 20 good men who are strong of back and weak of mind to help me get that thing up on the 10 o'clock. We meet at Mother's Kitchen on the morning of the 17th, not this weekend, but next weekend. And I can't lift all 1,500 pounds by myself. So I could really use the help. Anyone in the meeting, please help. If you can think of any friends who are foolish enough to come up there um, and invite them too. And uh, all we got it, we got to move it about 20 feet and get it onto the back of a trailer that I brought or that I'm bringing. Uh, let me see. Is there anything else, John, Joe? Um, not that I can think of. Well, you might mention our project with the six meters. I can do better than that. Uh, I don't even know if you've seen it yet, John. Let me see. Repeater technical chair. Where is it? Go to this, then go here, then go here, then click this. And the schematic got done about three or four hours ago. We don't see it yet. You will, it's got its little logo thing flashing up. 
saying that it's doing something, even if it's wrong. Donk. There it is. It's a very complex device. It has two ICs. So the schematic was finished a few hours ago. This is the same power supply that's in the other unit, same pinout. So when you go to the 3D visualizer, if it'll work, watch. I don't even know if it'll work on Zoom. I've never tried it. Apparently not. All I'm getting is a green screen. Anyway, there's the board. Got a couple ICs to put down. There's the power supply. So uh, I expect it'll be finished before the weekend. Is that what you wanted to mention, John? Yeah, just that uh, it was in work. Uh, that we we uh, the I built a little kludge board out of wire wrapped wire and uh, hot glue, and for some strange reason, it didn't like to keep working. So uh, I wear this, this. Hopefully, will be more reliable in the long run. I build this stuff to Mill Standard two thousand, Charlie. Nothing like a mill standard. Die, die cast aluminum boxes. Clue us in. Tell us what it does. Uh, this is just an unbelievably simple interface. Basically, what it takes is it takes, hello, it takes the um, receiver re signal, the, the squelch signal, and the CTCSS signal. I can make, make it a little. So this says that it broke squelch, and this is CTS, CTCSS. It ands them together to get a combined signal. Then it generates an artificial reference because I'm using a, um, a single power supply. So, And then it takes the audio, feeds it into a 10 to 1 gain amplifier, turns that amplifier on and off, and routes the audio output over to here, which is to the repeater controller, and routes whether or not the squelch and CTCSS is valid over here. And then for any of you guys, so that's all it does. Very simple circuit. So for any of you guys who are serious about lightning strikes and EMP, uh, what you do is you put a series resistor, and this is a polyfuse self-resetting fuse. This thing shunts at five volts. This is, these are called transorbs. They're capable of handling, you know, like a couple thousand watts for like a half a millisecond. So, uh, and over that, then it blows this fuse and resets. Then as far as filtering, this is called a, um, a uh, pi filter. So uh, I've got a re uh, capacitor in here to clamp some of the high speed stuff. A couple of ferrite beads. These beads were chosen specifically for the theoretical rate of rise of a lightning strike. And yes, if you look on the internet, you can find the rate of rise of a lightning strike. Then um, a lot of people don't know, but capacitors, because they have a uh, package and there's inductance in the package, Every capacitor has a self-resonant frequency. So you tend to put three caps as decades, 0.1, 1, and 10 microfarads. Then this is just a plain old linear regulator cap. This is really fancy. This is an LED to tell that it's on. And that's the power supply. Enough? There'll, there'll be a... For anybody who cares... Um, I can send them PDFs of what the bo laid out board looks like. And the visualizer was working, but I think it's mad at, at uh, Zoom. It never worked on Skype either. Hey, Mark? Yes, sir. Is there a, um, in regard to that tower, is there a potential for lowering the amount of manual labor? that your name? Yes, but I wasn't going to mention it now. Oh. There's there's the work smarter, not harder version. Uh -huh. And But uh, if I say that, then everybody will say, oh, someone else will take care of it. Oh, yeah, I understand. But 
Well, and based for the qualifications that you asked for, that doesn't really apply working smarter. True. Anyway, uh, are you guys seeing the 3D interface now? Yeah. yeah, it's working now. Oh, I just had to close it and reopen it so that Zoom recognized it. There's going to be a whole two more ICs in that great big blank area, which, by the way, this board is like an uh, inch and a half by two inches. These are the little tiny DB9 connectors for serial ports. Anyway. Uh, I would make a comment. What happened was that the uh, six meter repeater was originally repeater three on an SCOM 7330 controller. And over a period of months, uh, we had it cross-linked with a different uh, 147 megahertz repeater and it was getting some activity, but not a heck of a lot. And uh, one day it just failed, it, uh, catastrophically quit working. And I went up there and uh, debugged it and come to the conclusion that the SCOM controller had died. So I have a different controller and uh, the different controller requires more audio level and a slightly different uh, receiver transmitter interface, but I don't want to make any changes to the original interface to the SCOM because I figure we're going to repair the SCOM controller eventually and get it back to the point where we can cross link them and uh, talk to them via the remote control and everything else. So uh, we do will have a repeater controller on it and we will have the repeater controller normalized in that, but we will have, uh, uh, I have to change some voltage levels and some audio output levels to make it work. The, right. original, the original circuit that I had put together looked like, uh, I call them airplane connections where uh, you, you put a, a, a nice uh, a, a leaded or a, a round metal can, a round metal can uh, uh, IC uh, and I metal can transistors from the 70s and uh, you put them together uh, with resistors that dangle in space uh, across the uh, vector board. And so after the, uh, you get all done with all of that, uh, then you just pack it with hot glue so that stuff doesn't short out. Mark says he's built circuits like that for missile components. They call it welded wire modules. Yeah, 3D wire modules. I've seen them, but I, I didn't know how anybody could have built the things. You essentially take they, two- PC They were a little boards. different. Yeah, you essentially take two PC boards with uh, components vertical between them and then smash them together and then weld all the wires to the components. All right, good info. Exciting. So what's the planned usage for the new tower? <laughs> oh, Mark, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle that one right now too? Uh, well, I, the, the, it's no secret that the club is in the, um, embryonic stages of trying to set up an HF station up behind all of the repeater stations or all the, the repeaters. So we want to have a remote HF node. By the way, I should note that uh, the gentleman who is donating this tower, that's what the tower was. It was a remote HF node for his house up in Arcadia. And that's what we're trying to do. So yeah, I can I can use plenty of help. Great. Okay. Any other uh, questions, comments for Mark? No. All right. Uh, Glenn, we'll move on to the membership chair report. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, we have 152 members right now, and I see that I've got, uh, I think, two new members and uh, and two uh, renewals or extensions. So that could make us uh, 150. 
five or it could make this uh, 153. I don't know. I'll get those in. I'll let the system tell me how many members we have then. Okay. And that's um, all I've got. Um, all right. Good. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and those of you who haven't seen um, the Palomar website now has a functional uh, join and renew buttons for, well, I can just go ahead and share here, share that one. So if you go to palomarearca.org and click on the join renew button here, uh, you can see that there's two identical forms here. One is a subscription. So you're annually renewing for individual or for the family. Uh, so this sets up PayPal automatic trans transactions every year. Uh, so you don't forget. And, um, you know, there's all the info to put in there so that we can get the proper stuff into the database. Or if you just want to do a one time new or renew individual family, individual family, uh, you can just do a one time payment. Um, so, you know, choose your poison automatic renewal. I put that on the left first ish to encourage people to do that. And uh, then the one time is, is over here. So if you need to renew, that's where you do it. And Glenn and I discovered that you can uh, put in a quantity when you pay by PayPal. So you can put in N years if you want. Uh, okay, nice. I did see, a, was it a five year came through? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, 10 year? Okay. Was, it, was it five? I think it was five. I think, okay. I saw, yeah, I saw a multi-year came, come in because uh, I get those emails as well. And I saw an amount. I was like, that's kind of high. What's that? <laughs> oh, multi-year. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. That concludes the announcements and such. So introdu introductions, your board of directors. Um, we, we currently don't have a webmaster, which is why things on the website take forever because I'm doing that too. I have now put all of the scopes on the website. Uh, the links for those are, are there. I fixed that about a half an hour before the meeting. So Glenn wouldn't give me a hard time, um, harder time. So if you are interested in uh, helping out or taking over the webmaster responsibilities, currently we use Joomla for content management. We're not tied to that. We can use, you know, WordPress or whatever. Uh, you know, the website could use an overhaul. So if you're interested, just drop me an email, president at palomarearc.org or the whole board at palomarearc.org. Uh, let's see, your trustee is Michelle W5NYV. Your scope editor is Keith, KM6CXW. Uh, Keith would appreciate any articles that you have. If you're working on a project, take a couple of pictures and write up an article. Uh, John did that great article about Wires X. Uh, make sure you see that in the current scope. So um, send those to scope at palomerarca.org to get those in there. Your repeater site and technical chair is Mark, KF6WTN, who you heard from. Membership chair is Glenn, AI6RR, that you just heard from. Uh, your directors are Chris, KD9LF, and Ron, AJ6FQ. Secretary, Jim, W6TQS. Treasurer, other Jim, K2VO. Charlie, NN3V, is your vice president. And I am Joe, your president, K6JPE. So thank you all for being here. I will now turn it over to Mark for what else can you do with RF that's not voice and video? I modified the subject for you, Mark. <laughs> okay. While you were there, I was just continuing to place components on that schematic. We probably don't need the remote share anymore. Okay. I think there's a button over here. And if you hit F5, something will happen. Any chance you can see that? Yep, yep. we see yeah. him. Excellent. All right, well, most of you guys know I've been designing stuff for many, many years. And uh, I've been using RF for things other than talking. 
In other words, there's times that you just really don't want to talk to anybody, but you still may need RF. One of the obvious ones is RFID. It's in everything from credit cards where you tap them on top of this uh, card reader now, badges to get into buildings. Uh, you, there, there's RFID laundry tags. So the way these things work, and you know, I realize this may bore you guys a little. For those of you who understand this already, bear with me. RFID is kind of cool because it's an electronic device, but it has no power source in it. Instead, what it has is a little coil, an antenna, so to speak. They, they operate at three different frequencies. Um, these are all ISM, industrial, scientific, and medical bands. 125 kilohertz, 13.56 megahertz, 915 megahertz, unless you're in the European Union. And they use 898 over there. And what you do is you pump RF into this thing and you rectify it. And that charges up a little capacitor that's on the silicon chip that you're using. When that capacitor gets up to a certain voltage level, it turns on the electronics and it runs off of the energy being generated through the antenna. Now, what happens is if the, the RFID device wants to talk back, it uses a transistor to short out the receiving antenna. And that causes a change in the SWR of the transmitting antenna. And then the transmitter can receive what those changes are. And it's, it's all just a certain amount of time. You know, uh, a, dash is, a, a dot and a dash, right? So after a fixed amount of time, it seems to me it was like six milliseconds when I designed the last one. Um, nah, or was it 60 milliseconds? Anyway, um, the transmitter starts requesting data by modulating its signal. It uh, it just AM modulates, it cuts the signal back significantly and then powers it up to full. Once it sends a packet saying, this is what I want, the other guy starts shorting out his, his antenna and sending it back. They all have pre-programmed information such as a serial number, lot code, manufacturing code, so on and so forth. Um, and that's the way they always start the messages. But some of the tags have either single time or reprogrammable areas. Some of them, like I said, it's one shot because they want the memory burned at the factory and they never want the user to be able to change it. Uh, or they've got areas where you can actually program flash memory in the thing. And then other sensors that I have played with um, have temperature sensors humidity sensors, and I've even had ones that report back um, body vital signs. So what do they look like, you, you may ask? This one happens to be a 13.56. Whoops, let's go back one. Anyway, this happens to be a 13.56. I was wondering where that guy went. Um, and the reason why you can tell is 125 kilohertz and 13.56 megahertz use B field. They use magnetic field. 915 megahertz, they use electric field. So they use E field. Near, near, way, um, near field and far field antennas. The 915, these guys here, and you might recognize these things getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's a logarithmic antenna because the frequency is not exact. So, and the way they make these things is not super precise. So it's top loaded with an antenna that acts sort of like a dipole. The chip is actually inside here, right there. And then it's also got a magnetic loop in here also that's tuned. First time I saw these things, I had to put them on a network analyzer. So I popped the chip off and actually measured a bunch of them. It's kind of cool the way they work. Anyway, um, European, North American, why? Because North American is a tiny bit higher frequency. 
by the way, uh, I don't know whether I'm actually uh, transmitting or any guys hearing me. So yes. feel free to try to, to just d jump in from time to time. We hear you fine, Mark. Okay. Um, did I? I have a question. I missed my pictures. Who, who's asking a question? Uh, Glenn. Okay. So, Go ahead, so Glenn. Aren't these also used like in the books in the library? And oh, yeah. Are they used as, as loss prevention things in stores on product? Yes. Okay. And they, they uh, some of these, like this style, are also sealed up and sewn into like sport jackets and expensive dresses and things. Yeah. And they're used as laundry tags. So in the old days when they used to care, it seemed like, like you bought a big expensive thing and the Home Depot would run something over it and then you could get out without it beeping. Do they, is that? Yeah, if you crush them, the by the way, the 125 kilohertz ones look just like these, only it's actually a very fine coil of 40 to 46 gauge wire. And one time I was silly enough, I actually unwrapped one. And there was like about 40 to 50 turns of 40 to 46 gauge wire. I ended up going to Paris where they hold all the patents, a little company called Space Code outside of uh, Paris to work on the original designs of these things back when nobody knew what RFID was going to be. And I got a lot of private tours around Paris at night because everybody wanted to show the American what what their city was like that was kind of fun so yes glenn the, the the things are ubiquitous and nobody that i know of has ever talked through one of these <laughs> I have a question sure maybe i misunderstood you or didn't hear right and at some point i thought you said this doesn't need any power now Somewhere there has to be power. Oh, okay. I missed uh, what it, it has no internal power supply. How's that for just, being a little more precise? That's just the RFID tag. Yes. And it the reader has to have something. The RFID reader generates enough RF power to induce okay, current into the antenna, which is then right. rectified. It and has an antenna. Yeah, and it has an antenna. Yeah, here. Got it. RF is rectified to charge a capacitor, which operates the electronics in the tag. And then this is how they talk. Yeah. One of the things that we should have patented it years ago is we designed a, a DS PIC circuit. I did the circuit and Bob did the firmware that generated every kind of failure you could possibly imagine with an RFID tag. And the PIC emulated four tags per channel and it had four channels. And you could put things like, as you could see, this design would really be difficult if you were to put a whole bunch of tags right next to each other because they're paper thin. If you were to grab yourself a stack of about 30 tags thick in your fingers, all right next to each other, they confuse the hell out of themselves. So what I was working with space code back in the day, one of the tasks that I was assigned was how to um, do setbacks so that if they tags collide with each other, they set back variable amounts Here's a big surprise, dependent upon the serial number of the tag, right? So that they don't stomp on each other forever. And that's now one of the tests that they have <laughs> is, can you take a big stack of tags and how many of them can you read in a second? Because when you first turn it on, they all try and talk at once. Anyway, any more comments on RFID? Well, since we're following that path, here's another one, wireless charging. I actually was in a seminar on this two weeks ago. So the bad news for all of us that have cell phones that will wireless charge, 
they use QI 2.0, which is pronounced Chi, by the way. And that is the charging spec. Right now, most everybody is running uh, 1.0 or 2.0. However, 3.0 was just made official, ratified, uh, and everybody in the world loves it. There's one, and it's higher power, by the way. <clears throat> the only problem is this actually does have a back channel that works almost identical to RFID <clears throat> in wireless charging that it, they, they negotiate how much power and so on and so forth. But the new one also includes security protocols. Now, the good news is, I'm not quite sure why, but everybody's paranoid about security. So the new one has a security protocols built in. The bad news is I can just see Apple and Samsung saying, you can only use our chargers, no aftermarket chargers. Be, and because they won't have the security authorization, just like inkjet printers now have a security chip in a lot of the ink cartridges, so you can't use aftermarket cartridges. Now, they normally run at 125 kilohertz, but here's the trick. In order to modulate the amount of power so that you don't overdrive the maximum input voltage of the receiver, the transmitter actually detunes up to as high as 200 kilohertz in order to detune this nifty little resonant circuit that's an LC circuit in the front of the receiver. And by detuning the antenna, you end up lessening the input voltage and you don't burn up the receiver chip. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, so there's the detunes, the circuit for control of power. 5 to 15 watts. Most of them are 10 or 15 these days. Communications work similar to RFID. I happen to know from lots of pain that if you get beyond a 6 millimeter gap, all bets are off. But 6 millimeters is really cool. So, you know, that's not that hard to hit. Anyway, um, BMW and Bosch have a really big wireless charger. They use it for the... Uh, for the i3 electric car. I don't know if it's hit the market yet. I saw the prototypes, had a talk with the design engineer who was totally amazed that somebody knew what he was talking about. Uh, and then I can tell you from one of the designs that I did, um, don't forget about heat dissipation. I ended up not putting enough cooling on my receive chip and it would work perfectly for about 30 seconds and then it would overheat and shut, shut itself down. This is how the GM EV1 charge, by the way, was inductive, and it burned down at least two people's houses that I know of. Wow. Oh, yeah, but it was a little different. It was inductive paddles. Well, there yeah, by the, this is inductive. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a little, I, um, this is actually a functioning chip. I ran this, I've tested it, and all I had to do is take U3 here, and add a lot more copper around the chip in order to get it to work. But here's this tuned circuit in the front that goes off and the, and the, and the transformer coil, whatever you want to call it, the receiver hangs off J10 there. And just because for people like Phil, uh, this is the wired charger over here. Cause you have gotta be able to charge it wired or wireless. And then um, these are some of the, this is a transmit coil. Um, a lot of times, if you don't know how your phone is oriented, you put one of these in and they have circuitry that selects the coil that couples best to your phone. So it may be this one sideways, it may be this one, it may be this one rotated 90 degrees and so on. This is worth, by the way, worth electronics. This one over here is really cute. That tiny thing is six millimeters in diameter and that's the charge coil for an iWatch or for an Apple watch. So Phil, there is BMW's new idea of how they're going to do this. And I had a chance to play with a functioning one 
and an I3 at CES, you drive over the thing and it recognizes, and this plate has like little feet that can move it around a little bit and it centers itself on your car and raises up till it's in touching the matching pad. So you got to get your car kind of sort of more or less in the right spot. You know, like if you go to one of those little car washes where they say pull up to here and stop, it was kind of the same sort of thing. And then this thing looks around, figures it out, raises up and charges the car and disables it until you hit a button saying stop charging. I understand. I've seen these things. In my opinion, it's uh, you know, the GM EV1 tried this 20 years ago. It was worthy the experiment that failed. It's fine for electric toothbrushes and and uh, and cell phones. But I mean, OK, how much power is wasted by this? How much time does it take you to charge your Tesla? I mean, it's a, about five seconds, about a five lot. seconds. Five seconds. My, my question was, again, what's the charging efficiency. Yeah, what's the efficiency? Yeah, the, the answer is through this thing, it's just like any other radio. It's about 50% efficient. Yeah, which is terrible. Which is terrible. Yeah, well, that's why on my design, this sucker got really hot. Yeah. Well, you can afford low efficiencies on these things. You can't afford it on cars. That's, um, that's my point. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's still in a prototype state. On the other hand, there are things that are even crazier. This is a project by Qualcomm, and it's basically wireless charging coils in a road. This particular test is being done in France. And you, as you drive along, it wirelessly charges your car. Yeah. So I know you can say all you want, but that's not going to stop people from working. Not going to stop them from trying. And that's how you learn. You know, you, you learn from trying these things. Um, personally, there's the, like you said, there's the efficiency. There's a lot of problems. But, yeah. you know, if, if you don't try, I, what is it uh, I just heard on TV the other day? Wayne Gritsky said you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. True. Okay. So people are taking shots still and more power to them. On the other hand, um, I, for the last five years or so, have been using a Bosch inject induction cooktop. Very low frequencies, 25 or 50 kilohertz. Um, the biggest burners are five kilowatts, which is impressive. Um, cooking is intended to make heat, by the way. Yes. So the way it works is the coils in the base induce eddy currents into the bottom of the pan that you're using. And then like on the variant I have, I actually have some pans that have RFID temperature sensors built into the center of the pan. And they talk back to the cooktop and you can keep the temperature a constant temperature. That, which is that would that, uh, let me interrupt him. That would be kind of a design problem to make a, a temperature sensor that worked at, on the bottom of a pan, uh, temperature wise. Uh, well, it depends on how hot you get it, but you're right, 500 degrees is a bit of a challenge. Um, I'm not quite sure how they do that one. I don't, I've never gotten mine that hot and I've never burned one up. I always keep mine below 350. But still, for silicon parts, that's pretty impressive. However, the pans are 100 bucks each, so I haven't taken one apart. Yeah, you could maybe just make one uh, where just a capacitance or something varies with temperature, and you wouldn't need any active electronics. Yeah, there. you could probably detune it. Just use it to detune it, which is how, like I said, that's how RFID works. I don't, if I didn't explain it adequately, is... When you, um, the, the chip, this chip is rated for a maximum of 18 volts. So when you come in here on the actual power lines, this pin one and 20, when you come in on those power lines, it's got to stay under 18 volts. So what the thing does is it starts at a higher frequency until this guy starts to respond through its communication lines, COM1 and COM2. 
And then it, um, once it starts to respond, then it can tell the transmitter, turn it up and turn it down until it gets the maximum amount of power through here that it needs without exceeding the maximum voltage. So yeah, they might be able to do something like that. That's what the guts of the inside of one looks like. The operative thing, Phil, is notice that big honking fan right there. So still not the most efficient. Uh, exactly. And uh, the, um, the one that I have is the first device I own that has uh, gallium nitride FETs in it. Any other comments, questions? Throw rocks at the presenter. So those units that don't have a built-in temperature sensor in the pan, or do they have another one under the glass? Or yes, how do they that register? that became that became a safety thing. Okay. Because you know, with a flame, uh, you know, with electric burners, the burner is twelve hundred degrees. That's all you're going to get. Uh, it'll make the pan red hot and smoke, but not destroy it. Yeah, but you don't As want to you, burn your soup either. Well, yeah. Oh, oh, I. The, the thing I did that freaked somebody out the first time, I, I tend to make too much soup and it goes all the way to the top of the pot. And I had a big five quart pot boil over. So I grabbed a bunch of paper towels that were flat, lifted the pot up, dropped the paper towels down on top of the burner and put the pot back on top again and continued cooking through the paper towels. They're not very thick and it's only, you know, it's, we're just coupling a field into the bottom of the pot, but cooking through paper towels just freak people out, which was kind of part of the fun of it. No comments, suggestions? Okay. So the next one is microwave ovens. Everybody knows that they run at about 2.45 gigahertz. There's also 915 and a couple other frequencies. Um, homeowner ones are usually eight to a thousand, sometimes 11, even 1300 watts. Um, so it turns out that water fat and other substances absorb energy by the dielectric heating. Many of the molecules, I'm, I, you're never supposed to just read what you wrote, but basically a lot of things are electric dipoles. So you can actually rotate the um, the molecules, spin the molecules, cause them to slam into each other and generate heat. Mainly water. Mainly water. The water although, is, although you can polar. put like pure olive oil in there and it'll heat just fine. Yeah, water is very polar, so that's why it heats so yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Anyway... Um, and for those who think that 2.45 gigahertz is the only uh, solution, the cover of Radio Experimenters magazine in 1935, they were cooking sandwiches with a 60 megahertz shortwave radio transmitter at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And here's just a section, a, a sectioned magnetron. Is that the one used it. then? No, I don't think that magnetron existed back then. No, because I thought the the, uh, the, the uh, cavity magnetron was a big secret. World War II, the Brits invented it. It's what no, this was artwork. no, this had this is a modern magnetron. Okay, okay. No, sorry, I didn't mean to imply anything other than that. Okay, just the fact that uh, they knew about this effect years and years ago and like i said this was a 60 megahertz radio transmitter that just radiated radiated into a cavity so i thought that was kind of cool i think that magnetron was probably a bigger breakthrough in world war ii than the atomic bomb was in terms of what actually what it actually did well we're going to talk a little bit more about that radio reflection off of stuff later but um, anyway, I thought this was an interesting discussion about microwave ovens. 
And I rarely talk through mine. Although I have heard people talk through their Tesla coils. <laughs> now, in impedance pneumography, I, I designed a couple of these. These are kind of fun. Um, it turns out that um, when your lungs fill up with air, they become more resistive. And when you exhale, and it's pretty much good conductive blood, the resistance drops quite a bit. I didn't measure the, didn't put in the magic number, which is 37 kilohertz, which I found out from our biotech guy over at CareFusion, that that's a lot of the magic frequencies for impedance measurements in the body. Anyway, so it turns out lungs are more resistive when they're filled with air. If you just measure, you just do an AC measurement of the resistance and you measure the time between the peaks, that's the breath, breath rate. And, you know, they talk about all sorts of things. I just use EKG electrodes mounted there and there. That was all there was to it. 37 kilohertz, low frequency RF. Now, as far as high frequency, MRI or magneto resonance imaging is this big monster device that generates a very strong electromagnetic field, but let's call it magnetic field really, around the area to be imaged. And then they have oscillating magnets around the or inside of the uh, fixed magnet to vary the field. And what they do, what you're doing is you're exciting atoms that emit an RF pulse when the field changes. And the, according to the research I was reading, because I have not designed an MRI, I was back in um, the FDA's uh, research and development facilities in uh, Washington, D.C. when they were testing one. And the guy was nice enough to go through it with me and explain it all. But I've never done one of these. So he said mostly it's hydrogen that you're looking to blow uh, electrons into the outer orbitals. And when they drop back in, they generate RF. And then, of course, you get a uh, the RF signal you have to process. And you can deduce the position by looking at the changes in the RF level and the phase. It's actually the RF frequency. Uh, what's happening is the, the because reason hydrogen is important is because the, the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is a proton, a single proton, and it precesses in the magnetic field. And because the magnetic field varies with position due to the pulsed magnets, the different atoms, reson or nu different nuclei resonate at different frequencies. So you have a smear of you know frequencies coming back. You use a fast Fourier transform to figure out uh, which ones are transmitting which frequencies, and that turns directly into position. A really cool idea. Those guys deserve their Nobel Prizes. But there's a lot of signal processing going on in one of these things. Yeah, I actually fell, ran into the original patent holder for 4 Pi the other day. Did you? Yeah, he lives up here in Valley Center. Actually, he's moving. Oh. And, and by the way, he donated all of his radio gear to the club. So if anybody wants oh. World War II, not not Vietnam or anything, but World War II radio gear. I've got a bunch of it stashed. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So this is, um, this is a little kind of a schematic of MRI unit. You'll notice the chirostack filled with liquid helium to get the superconducting, base superconducting magnet to conduct. And one of the things I always find hilarious is most people don't realize that when an MRI is completely off, because that liquid helium has the superconductor uh, going, that unless you do something specifically to drain the charge off of the magnet, it stays on without driving it. In other words, that static magnetic field is on all the time, even with the MRI unit turned off. So there's actually a whole website called MRI Accidents. Most of them you see an MRI unit with a bent up floor polisher in it, where the, uh, the uh, custodian did not realize that 
you, there's a reason why you're not allowed to bring <laughs> ferrous metals into the MRI room. So there's all these pictures of four floor <laughs> polishers, wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, gurneys, stuffed into MRIs. It's amazing how much they can fold them down when that field is strong enough. Anyway, next story. Stud sensors. Another device that uses RF. Everybody's seen them before, right? You wipe them along the drywall in your house and they tell you where the stud is behind it. They do it by, um, by measuring the change in the dielectric constant of the material underneath. And by searching around, I found out that most of them work around three kilohertz. I have not measured mine. In fact, I don't even know what I've got. I guess I could do an FFT on the oscilloscope. My network analyzer doesn't go that low. Anyway, um, cute little things, very handy, use very low frequency RF, although there are some of them, the fancy ones that actually use 10 gigahertz microwaves and they actually work like radar. I don't have one of those, they're a little pricey for me. Now, another thing that's kind of a handy little device are wire tracers. You guys have, I don't know if you've got one of these. I ended up with two, one for doing uh, power, which is what we're talking about here, and the other one for finding Cat5 cable, Cat6, whatever, for internet. And basically, what you do is you inject 125 kilohertz into, the, into a wire, a metal pipe, whatever. Um, the one that I've got says that if it's not pure water, which in San Diego, pure water is never sent through the pipes. Um, I like to joke around and say that we drink the water that cut the Grand Canyon. Anyway, um, that there's enough conductivity in the water to even go through plastic pipes for a while. And the one I've got claims 2.5 meters range for doing buried pipes and things like that. So far, the only thing I've used it for is to find uh, conduits under the driveway. And it's funny, the way it works is you actually have a little ground stake. And you would think if you had two wires, you'd just hook one lead to each wire. But then the field cancels itself out a couple of feet in because the wires are, you know, twisted pairs or they're running parallel in Romex or anything like that. So what you end up doing is you end up put, injecting a signal into, uh, into one wire, and it's AC coupled, by the way, and you can inject it into live circuits if you want. Um, the one I've got can put up to 110 milliamps, worst case, um, at up to 400 volts. So you gotta kind of be careful not to use it on real sensitive stuff. But it'll superimpose this 125 kilohertz AC. And then you uh, and then you take your ground wire and you actually shove it into this, you know, foot and a half long ground spike to get the uh, to get the R, the transmitting and ground reference separated. And then this is the little receiver. And you just walk along, and like I said, it, it works, you know, up to about six, seven feet. So it's good for finding stuff buried, tracing stuff in walls, that kind of thing. So would you say, is this the same technology as when you call 1-800-DIG and they come out, tell you where the gas lines are? Yes, it beams? is. Yes, it is. Okay. Same thing. They have, sometimes they have them that inject even more. And I have to bend over. I don't have one of the ones that looks like a golf club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have to bend over with mine. But anyway, that's a handy little thing. Lastly, uh, this is the last one that I have prepared, is uh, discussing weather radar, which is kind of a specialized version of general radar. I'm sure that most of you guys know that what you do is you send a, uh, a chirp about a microsecond or so long. 
and you uh, wait and listen for the backscatter off of objects from that chirp. And therefore, you can tell when there's something in your path. And then if it's a Doppler radar, you can measure the change in frequency of the reflected chirp, and you can find out whether it's going toward you or away from you. So this is just kind of a basic explanation. You fire a great big monstrous powerful pulse. And then you, after that pulse, you listen for reflections. Now, what's interesting is weather radar. I didn't realize how complex they've gotten in the subject. They have horizontally and vertically polarized signals. And they use the two to determine the types of objects, because some things, it turns out, snowflakes tend to like to respond more in one axis than the other, where raindrops respond firmly in both axes. So apparently that's how they were able to tell the difference between the two. And then these are the, the return levels for what they're suggesting. Um, per the National NEXRAD weather radar satellites, R radar sites, excuse me. And then of course, uh, if anybody who's driven out to the Costco on uh, Scripps Poway Parkway and looked slightly to the, what is that? That's the south, has seen a great big golf ball sitting on top of a giant T. And that is SDX. That's the San Diego uh, weather radar. So they're getting, and by the radar, which is pretty directional, right? It's a great big dish. By sweeping up and down, they also get height and distance information, both from the length of the ping, the amount of reflection, the height, and then they sweep across it. Now, I know there are many other examples, but quite frankly, I spent all of my time Trying to get uh, trying to get wires X up and running, so I'm sorry that I only took 37 of my allocated minutes. Is there any discussions? Anybody want to talk about anything? Other things? Well, that the uh, charging, did everybody hang up on me? The wireless charging makes me think of. Gee, was Tesla completely right, or was he only partially right? Transferring energy over air through space oh yeah no he can do that you can you can do that and the you only problem by tesla not tesla the company yes not tesla the company as yeah. in nicola nicola uh yeah certainly you can the problem with his tesla coils was that they used a spark gap to generate broadband rf mm -hmm. so i mean yes he was transmitting huge amounts of energy and in Colorado, he was accused of witchcraft because he was lighting up um, neon-filled spheres down in the town below where he set up his giant Tesla coil with no nothing connected to them. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's all sorts of cool things. But, uh, um, it, you know, broadband would pretty much prevent any radio being used for anything else. So I also noticed, guys, there's only six of us left. Actually, there's 20. No, that's just what you're seeing on your sidebar. There are still yeah. 20 people in here. Wow. I thought I had everybody, but. Look at the bottom of your screen under participants. Just do the count. Uh, uh, John, with a comment? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I talked to some old time radar people, oh, lots of years ago. Anyway, uh, I, the micro, uh, they, uh, the way they used to test for polarity feeds on the uh, radar dishes back in World War II was to put their hands in front of the uh, dish. Oh. And if their hand got warm because of, in the vertical position, it was vertically polarized. If their hand got warm in the horizontal, 
then they knew that it was horizontally polarized oh radar God. signals. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, as I remember it, what the story was, was they had some poor photographer sitting on the fan tail of a ship and the ship was in a heavy seas. And as the, uh, sh the rear of the ship raised up and but the dish radar dish stayed horizontal they took and fried all of his uh, photo uh, all of his photo flash bulbs instantaneously he got severely burned but uh, they had to be they found out that they they were dealing with hazardous levels of RF uh, during World War II even though uh, they didn't understand it at the time well I actually worked at Hughes uh, aircraft in Tucson where they did the experiment with the popcorn that everybody was familiar with where the guy, the engineer melts the candy bar in his shirt. So the next day he brings popcorn kernels then he pops them on the desk. That was done in building two at the uh, Hughes site. And that's where later Amana licensed the technology for the radar range, even though they'd done it before. That was kind of where the aha moment occurred. So many, I heard it, many years before me. I have heard it claimed. I mean, it's, it's based on what I was saying before, and Charlie might want to count a, a comment on this, but I have heard it alleged that, you know, the, the Magnetron was probably the single biggest technical breakthrough of World War II, but bigger than the Tommy bomb and the effect that they had in the war because it made, um, you know, S-band, well, microwave radar really practical on a large scale. And um, I mean, the Brits actually developed it and we, we got the idea from the Brits. And I believe it's basically the same design we have today. I did not know that. I mean, there have been- I know one thing, about one, this. one thing that was kept relatively quiet back when I was dealing with the Navy and Charlie, you'd get it, you, you would get a kick out of this one. Uh, as you know, over at uh, North Island, they have the carriers with huge radars up on the top of the uh, up on the top of the towers, and they have to test them regularly. So they were directed to rotate them out to sea before they started firing pulses uh, on these huge radar units. So a, a couple of the people with more twisted sense of humor would leave them pointed out to sea and then wait for pigeons to come or seagulls to come land on the feed horns. And then they got four or five guys that would go out and watch the radar while somebody hit a pulse and they had instant fried squab falling yeah. onto the deck. And apparently the uh, PETA or some of the animal rights groups ended up uh, when I was there getting them forced to now they have to spin the, uh, the dish for a full minute before at speed before they fire any radar pulses out of it. Well, there's, there's all sorts of guidance for how you taste that equipment. <coughs> but you bring to mind a very funny story. One of the ships I served on was um, an experimental, it wasn't quite experimental. It had the introduction radar of uh, 3D radar. So you can measure range, azimuth, and elevation for aircraft purposes. And uh, <clears throat> the um, um, waveguide that went from the transmitter to the antenna was about six inches in diameter. And it went through a compartment that was a storage locker. And when the ship was in the overhaul, things moved around. And when, when they got done, the bosun mates, those are the deck force, got that locker as a storage area. 
Nobody told them to stay away from that pipe. And so they did. It's in the way. You got a hacksaw. Zoop, zoop, zoop. Put it out. And nobody knew that in the electronic side of the ship. And before getting underway, they tested the radar. Of course, that magnetron fired straight into an infinite impedance and exploded the entire transmitter cap. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking if the if the if the room were closed up, that's just a resonant cavity. That too. You just got to tune the room. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Joe, that's, I'm afraid that's all I have. The, the plan was to do wires X for the remaining 15 minutes or so, and we're wires Xless. So perhaps next month we'll have it functioning. Yep. I was uh, remiss in my duties of watching the other chat. Uh, Bill in SD, I don't know a call sign on the YouTube channel, um, made some comments that I'm not seeing timestamps on. Um, but uh, some comment was earlier, some five gigahertz channels can interfere with radar, weather radar, five gigahertz Wi-Fi that is. Uh, SPS 48 radars blast everything in range. Uh, Mare Island held radar classes on the night shift to not interfere with SFO. Uh, and most older carriers had those high power um, precursors to Aegis phased array. So I'm not sure when those were come. Sorry, Bill, for uh, missing those comments. Uh, this is one of those learning things that we need to do when we have people in multiple platforms. And right now, well, we I, have, uh, I know the Aegis phased array is predate the design. I worked on the planning when that was moved from Pomona to Hughes in 1991. So I worked on the phased array then, and it predated me by a long time. I can assure you that you don't want to light off the phased array of an Aegis cruiser in San Diego Harbor. Well, <laughs> just, just the phased array or the coupling system? Light it off to transmit. Ah. You don't want to know that. No. I still think that's one of the coolest things. Oh, yeah. I um, Back when I was working on the, the planning for that, I, um, yeah, and for those of you guys who don't know what that is, that's the phalanx gun that's, using the, that's used in the um, standoff weapon system. And it's an automated 20-millimeter, six-barrel Vulcan cannon guided by a phased array. And um, I don't know if you... Pardon me, Charlie? Um, depleted, um, depleted yeah. uranium bullets. Yeah, depleted uranium rounds, which are 60% more dense than lead. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, Charlie, the, uh, the bullets are boat tail, and the radar actually uses the reflection off of the boat tail stream yeah. of bullets to, to move the stream of bullets to the target. That it brings sense. the two together. And it uses the reflection of the bullets because they're so close to each other. Sure, but, why not? I mean, that way you compensate for wind and other Sure, things. you compensate for everything. Yeah. But uh, I decided since we were designing them there that I needed to liven things up. You guys know me. So uh, it, Photoshop was just getting to the point where it was getting good back in the early 90s. So I Photoshopped in a second gun on one of the phalanx and I had a twin gun phalanx with a nice big eight by 10 print over my desk on something that we were working on in R and D and people would walk by and they'd go back my desk and then they'd walk backwards about six steps and they'd look and look, and look as, Oh yeah, that's the twin phalanx, you know, if, if two you years, guys. See, if you want to see a great video, that shows what those close-in weapon systems can do. <clears throat> Google 
Iron Dome. That's the missile defense system that the um, Israelis have around Tel Aviv. You'll be amazed. And it's one of the reasons why the, um, the Hamas attacks on Israel back about a month ago out of something like 2,000 missiles, they only got four through the Iron Dome. It's a phenomenal video. Yeah, and if you've ever heard those things run, they do not sound like firearms. No. It's this loud buzz. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, interesting right. devices. Hey, Charlie, uh, do we have anything in the queue for next month yet? Well, <clears throat> I, I've only had one effort and the potential presenter hasn't responded. Um, I'm looking for another one that the uh, Escondido Club says is good, and I'm trying to hook up on that. Well, Charlie, I am going to request a few minutes at the beginning of the next one to do Wires X that we weren't able to do tonight. I should have, should have it ironed out by then. If uh, who knows how long I'll be bothering poor John Walker trying to uh, because I, I can't test it because the node is right here and and I, I keep uh, swamping the the node transceiver if I try and transmit from here. So I'm the only guy in San Diego County who can't use wires X once it's all up and running again. Unless I figure some way to get that radio isolated from everything else here. So I have a comment. Um, it has to do with uh, Joe's question for Charlie there. It's, that's that us as uh, members of the club, I think we have to put our own brains at work and decide if, if come up with things we would like to learn about or hear about and share those with Mark or um, well, Charlie initially. And uh, let him know. What would we like to see? What would we like to have Charlie be able to pursue and, and bring to the, the meetings and educate, help educate us? Yeah. And uh, one other I, thing. I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Glenn. One other thing. So in regards to the work party on the 17th, if you want to send stuff to me or to Mark, we'll start coordinating who is willing to come up there. And uh, one of the things we'll do is get to the uh, storage shed and get a bunch of hard hats and we'll map out what people need to bring, gloves, water, uh, long pants, the whatever those stickery things were, uh, were pretty nasty up there the other day. Yeah, it was just fox, wild fox oats. Sales. Yeah, fox sales. Yeah. He claims, and he says he's going to do it this weekend, so I'll drive up again. He claims to have all the brush knocked down before our next trip. So keep your fingers crossed. That's all I got. Thanks. Well, I have a quick question. Was this presentation tonight of any interest to anyone? Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, is not Th Thomas, I, I got your number. I went to Cal Poly up at San Luis Obispo. I used to hang out in the arrow in the arrow hangar. So cool stuff. The one thing I've been amazed about uh, this Qi, how do you pronounce it? Uh, the charging wireless charging? Qi. 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 It's actually a Chinese letter, I believe. Um, is I have actually have a hard time hearing it. With all of those switching power supply noise around my house, I expect it to give me a hard time. And I can barely hear it. I'm surprised. Okay. So if you look at it with a silly scope, even though it's transmitted as a square wave, there is so much capacitive tuning of the circuit that when you look at it, it looks sinusoidal. No, I mean, on its fundamental frequency. I mean, I was looking for it down at- At, at 125 kilohertz? Yeah, I was amazed. I could barely see, I could see it, but it was really weak compared well, to all the other crap floating around here. Okay. Um, you didn't- I mean, They seem to have done a good job on that. 
Yeah. Um, that a sense of magnetic shielding and the coupling? Well, well um, I've been seeing comments. I mean, I've been getting on this kick about trying to clean up low frequency you know, LF band uh, noise lately. And um, somebody who I think should know, N6GN, Glenn Elmore, um, who I knew many years ago, he popped up on a forum for the QSDR and said that at these low frequencies, you have to think differently. Um, nothing radiates because the, free, the wavelengths are so long that the radiation resistance of any structure you're going to build, wire, so forth, is just too short to radiate. It's all about common mode coupling and ground loops. And that actually made sense. Yeah, if you look at these things, um, this backing that they're all glued to is always ferrite. And I know because yeah. I've accidentally broken a few of them. And then in the center, um, they've got a ferrite plug coming up through the center. And some of them even have a little bit of ferrite on the outer edge. This yeah, one's the point so is, tiny. So how, is it, it was, how is it isolated from the power line? It's isolated through a power supply. Uh, the one I have uh, has a USB-C power connection. Oh, I, I can't tell you on those. I can tell you on what I did. Yeah. Uh, on the transmit I mean, do you have one side. For your phone? I have one for my phone. That's why I know. Yeah, I don't know how the how the Chinese do it. The way I did it, obviously, is rectify everything to DC. Right. Ferrite, ferrite chokes all over the place. Sure. And uh, and then the out, the output of the thing, even though it generates a square wave, yeah. is resonant. Yeah. So by the time you start looking at the field out on the end of this thing out here, yeah, it, it's sinusoidal, and it's right. not. I understand that. And I mean, that's good for stopping harmonics. But what Glenn seemed to be saying is that down at these low frequencies, if you're trying to suppress the fundamental, also, none of that seems to matter because the radiation resistance of any stray antenna is too small to matter. What matters is that you have good isolation from the power line. You've got a galvanic oscillator, which you well, already have in the form of wall wart, right? Yeah, and well, your power nurse the wall wart, right? Yeah, it depends. If the wall wart's a transformer, most of them well, are solid. They are. Solid. I mean, you know, you're not. Gonna... No, most of them are solid state now. Well, yeah, but there's still something to isolate. There's still a transformer in there, even if it's a solid. Yes, state. yes, it's a, a it's a high frequency transformer. Right, right, yeah. Comment. Is, is there a common mode conduction path from there out through the power line? And if they knock that down. It seems to be pretty good. Go, go ahead. ahead. Con yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. John. Well, just so you'll know, that word chi is a very common word. It refers to the life force energy going through the body, not the blood supply. It has its own channels throughout the body and they trace it through the chakras. And the chi is sort of similar to the word spirit in, in, a, in a human uh, uh, connotation. It's the life giving force that makes the body actually function oh. the, uh, the the jump start as it were it's like the it's, it's like the hindu word prana so what they're doing there is they're saying this is the very basic moving energizing force that makes everything happen just thought you'd like to know well, it's a good word good name to, to choose for this then So I was also surprised when I had my EV1, I went looking for the signal. When it's fundamental, I could barely hear it. You know, Hughes built that thing. When I opened up the charger, it's it's all metal. The outside is completely shielded. And I actually had to lay an antenna probe on the charging cable for me to even be able to hear it on its fundamental. So it's possible, you know, if these things are designed right, it's possible to make them quiet. It's only when they don't do it right that they get noisy. That thing was six or seven kilowatts. I was amazed. Yeah, you're out of anything that I've ever designed. Yeah, Hughes did this, but it was, you know, back in the mid-1990s. I personally think that electric, uh, inductive charging for cars, this is my personal opinion, inductive charging for cars was a worthy experiment that failed. It was worth trying, but, you know, there's just too many problems with it. And it's just not a problem. To, I mean, when I get out of my car, it takes me five seconds to plug it in. It's, it, I just don't see it as being an issue. The, uh, a quick uh, comment. Um, what about wireless internet where they use the AC power lines and we're purposely oh jamming 
Oh, uh, oh. I guess 125 kilohertz or something. It's, more, it's much line. more than that, John, because they have the much, much more bandwidth. You, you mean wireless internet? Or, uh, I, I remember that it was jamming frequencies all the way on up to 20 and 20 and 15 yeah. meters. That's it's kind of like broad. Remember broadband over power line? It That's works what like he's that. Talking about. That's what he's yeah, talking about. Well, no, he's talking about. I think you're talking about the stuff that works over your home power lines that you plug right. in. The wall. Yeah. Well, they well, also are trying to do that. It's the but same I, idea. It's having lots of multi harmonic uh, high frequency signals. Well, it's exactly the same idea as BPL, because, except you're running inside your house because these things use these uh, OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplex modems. OFDM. It's a fancy term for just having lots of low speed modems all side by side in, in the spectrum. And if you want enough, you want the high data rate, you're gonna have to cover the whole HS spectrum with these things. That's why it wipes out everything. You know, and you can try to chop out the hand bands in it, but if you do, any intermodulation distortion in the amplifiers is going to fill it right back in again. Yeah. So yeah, I'm with you. I hate them. Yeah. But it seems like a, an idea that was born and went through all kinds of work and lots of people tried to do it, then it failed. Yeah, it's, yeah if any, I find anybody around here doing that, I mean, I'll offer to go buy them Wi-Fi base stations to cover their house <laughs> if that's what it takes. I'll, I'll happily pay out of pocket, you know, to clean that stuff up. All uh, right. One other quickie comment. I know that it's not really radio, but it is electromagnetic radiation. Uh, further on down the line, you might talk about uh, laser weapons, if you've had any experience with uh, generating uh, megawatts or multi -kilo hundreds of kilowatts with laser weapons. I have not done laser weapons. I've done well, laser, laser welding. I've done laser welding. Well, similar technology. Uh, that's that's a higher frequency. That's up in the terahertz range. But the guy to talk to about laser communications would be Kerry Banky. Um, he he's done it. I mean, it was quite a few years ago. I don't know if he's done it recently, but you know, he's the guy who's done it. You got to be careful have, nowadays. You know, the FAA is very sensitive to people shining lasers around the sky. I remember in one of the field days. Yeah. In two thousand two or two thousand three. That we was, demonstrated laser communications. That was, I think that was it. I think that was him. Yeah. From Palomar Mountain. Oh, Palomar with the two rifle, rifle scopes. Yeah. 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 That was pretty cool. I think nowadays you want to do it, you got to probably talk to the FAA, do your homework and make sure yeah. you're okay with them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really tight beam. What they don't know. Huh? I said it's a really tight beam. If they don't know it, you probably won't get in trouble. Well, you look, it could get reflected. You know, if it's visible light, you got to be very careful. If it startles yeah. a pilot, you're in big trouble. So my thinking is if you do it infrared, infrared carries better anyway. And if you do it infrared, they won't see it. It won't bother them. So it may be harder to align. You might want to use a visible light, visible laser just for alignment, then turn it off and use infrared for communication. And, you know, if the FA doesn't have a problem with infrared, so much the better. I mean, you'll find YouTube videos of people who are building death rays out of these visible light lasers, that pop balloons with them and so forth. And, man, they look dangerous. So I won't play with those. Then you'll see guys making, you know, you know idiotic idiots in the Ukraine or Russia were making death rays out of microwave oven uh, magnetrons. By the way, I, I can tell you, Phil, that if you crack the uh, um, the ferrite on the back side of these things, uh, you can give up any kind of efficiency that you thought you might have had. Well, yeah. So when you talk about coupling the field through the ferrite and, and using it like a transformer, yeah, it, it really acts more like a transformer than it does oh, sure, sure. RF emitter. Sure, just like the EV1 and uh, magnet, they called it magnet charger, was the term Hughes had for that system. Unfortunately, it burned two people's houses that I know of. Oh, it wasn't actually the transformer, it was a capacitor, it was an oil filled paper capacitor 
inside the coupler unit that resonated with the uh, transformer. And um, in one house I know of, it was a coworker at Qualcomm. Um, that capacitor basically caught fire. And the front of the car was made of flammable material. So, you know, ignited the garage. Whoops. That was bad. Yeah. And what really ticked me off is I found out from the GM engineers, this was a known problem. They didn't fix it. That really soured me to GM. That was, that was irresponsible. Uh, kind of like the Knowing gas tank a on the Pinot. And not fixing it. Kind of like the gas tank on the Pinot, huh? Exactly. Exactly. And as a result of that, to... I started making a stink about that. GM just called all the cars back, kept them. That was the first batch from 1998. It's funny that although you can't see it on this one, that's actually two coils wound in parallel. Yeah. The cool ones, though, are these little bitty guys. Uh, there was one up here a minute ago that are for the iWatches because I've, I've got another use for them besides wireless charging. What, burning up iWatches? No. No. These little bitty guys, they're so cute. Now, hopefully once I get a patent issued, I'll, uh, I'll let you guys in on it. Oh, oh, I know what you did. Did you talk about, um, um, Apple pay and whatever the Google equivalent is when you lay your I, I, it, did you uh, that? Well, I know I have Samsung pay. Probably the same. I imagine you know Google, frequency probably frequency? Google pay. What, what frequency? Um, it's the same, uh, 13.56 megahertz RFID. All right. So it's the, it's the HF one. All right. Yeah. It works pretty yeah, well. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, you can't do it with an Apple watch or with an Apple because Apple very carefully protects you from everything. Yeah. Uh, but I have on my phone, where is it? It's called for Android, it's called NFC tools that's their, and what it does is pardon me that that's their their pay scheme for a credit card point of sales no 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 this is uh if you're uh, a strange person like me and you're curious about all this stuff nfc tools allows you to take direct control over the um rfid transceiver in your phone oh oh Oh, I see. And you can read prox cards. You can read uh, the badges that they have, you know, for going into Qualcomm. Yeah. Um, you And uh, depending on whether it's encrypted or not, if it's encrypted, it'll just simply come back and say it's encrypted. Yeah. But if it's not encrypted, it'll read out all the sections for closed tags at Walmart or wherever. Yeah. Hey, Mark, is it that NFC tools? I've got it on my on the iPhone. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Last I checked, it wasn't iPhone worthy. Does it look like Can't so hear you, Joe. You, you're, you're muted, Joe. So, so, Joe, what happens if you take that and lay it on a point of sale terminal? Um, I was muted because I was talking to my kids, not you. Oh. <laughs> Hold it up. Let's see it. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, well, that sure yeah. looks a lot like it. So I've got read, write, other, and my say blogs. I'm trying to think. I don't. Oh, wait. Do I? I don't have anything. I don't have any RFID tags in my uh, field of. Well, next time you go to a store. You got a, cre you got a credit store. card. You got a credit card in your wallet. Um, the, uh, my wallet's not in my field of control right now. It's so Anyway. Up. So all that point of sale stuff is 13.58, uh, Mark? Most all of it's 13.56 megahertz, yeah. So so with these different frequencies, what's the advantages, pluses and minuses, these different frequencies? Well, first, you'll notice the frequencies are all the I, uh, the uh, all ISM. ISM, yeah. But, but the, uh, the, 125, the 125 kilohertz was the original one. Yeah. And that's kind of where I started with this thing. Like I said, when I was flying back and forth to Paris. Yeah, And uh, the original purpose, by the way, you might find out the first contract, which if you go to anywhere and you look at the patents, they always say that it's um, 
licensed technology from a company called Space Code just outside of Paris. Okay. They're kind of the father of this stuff. Okay. Anyway, um, the original technology was um, loose cut diamonds in envelopes. Oh. And they would put a tag in the envelope and then they made safes with RFID antennas inside the safes. And it would very quickly read all the envelopes. And it would, if one of them came out through the coil on the front of the door, it noted that that envelope and, and diamond left the safe. Okay. And it, and it would log, you know, the diamonds that went in and the diamonds that went out on these little okay. purpose built envelopes. Okay. So the nice thing about 125 kilohertz is you're working, you know, at a much, much smaller um, value than the wavelength. So they, the coils are just great big coils that were wrapped around the external periphery of the safe. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it because we were measuring the same sort of thing. Only instead of diamonds, we were measuring cardiac catheters. Mm-hmm that were going in and out of a storage facility in an OR and, mm-hmm. and the doctor would look and say, yeah, I think I need that one. They'd pull that cardiac um, stent. They'd pull the stent out, use it, and it would bill the patient for the stent. Hmm. So uh, then they went to 13.56 cause 125 kilohertz is handy, but it's expensive to wind that little coil. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, you know, you got a whole bunch of turns of 40 something gauge wire. And if you ever pop one of those open, that wire is much smaller than hair. Yeah. It's gotta be expensive to make that. Yeah. So it's not trivial to make those things. So they went to 13.56 because as you saw from the picture that I had, you can print that stuff Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they, they don't use a PC board process. Believe it or not, it's a um, screen printing process. They print conductive ink on mylar film Mm -hmm. rather than etching board material. And it's a roll to roll process. They'll take a roll of film two inches wide and a hundred feet long and just roll the stuff on it. Mm. And then, uh, and then they punch a hole through. And they roll the backside with a little diagonal stripe to get into the back of the chip. And then they glue the chip with conductive epoxy Mm -hmm. to make it cheap. And then that gets sandwiched between a couple of paper layers. And that's the Zebra RFID tag. Okay. So the nice thing about 13.56 is it's still B-field. It's still close range and cheap. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go to 915... Now you're working with E field. Yeah. Well, and most, most of the um, tags that are used for shipping containers and marking uh, boxes in pallets, those sort of things, they're getting a range of up to 10 feet out of the 915 megahertz job. You're out of the near field. It's a radio signal now. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're all, you're working E field with this stuff. Well, it means it's a radio signal. You're out of the, out of the news. Yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, one of the more common ones that that's, you see is they have a coil, a uh, receiver, not a coil, but a receiver on both sides of where they back the semis into a warehouse. Right. And as the guy goes in there with a forklift and pulls a pallet out, there are tags on the individual items in the boxes. And then there's one on the box and one on the pallet. Mm -hmm. So they, as he pulls this thing out, uh, it reads all of those. There's um, thing magic is one of the big companies that does this. Mm -hmm. And another one, their, their products called speedway, but I can't remember the name right this second. Both of them are based back in Boston. Mm -hmm. And, and as you read this stuff at a rate of a thousand tags a second, Mm-hmm. And uh, by the time the forklift can get off the back of the truck and 10 feet into the warehouse, this thing's read all of the tags on all of the boxes, all of the items in the boxes and the, the forklift pallet. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good. 
but once again, in order to get the range, you got to go up to 915. And then there's ones that I didn't even mention. Uh, have you ever noticed on the sides of box cars, there's a black box that screwed onto the uh, rail car? Yeah, I thought that's they used optical, but I guess they added that to, to the optical. Yeah, stuff. That, that what that is, that's a 2.45 gigahertz active RFID tag. Okay. But the it, but it's not active until they pound it with a radio signal at trying to remember the frequency. It's a much lower frequency. And once you activate the tag, the tag wakes up and responds it at uh, Wi-Fi kind of frequencies. I see. So it's not powered. And yeah. All right. And they've got uh, they've they've got nice focused um, yagis to activate those tags from a hundred feet away. So they can read this as the train is barreling down the track. At That's the speed. whole idea. They read them as the train is going through the switching yard without yeah. ever stopping the box cars. Yeah, that's good. And those are called active tags. Okay. What are a lot of these things? I know Qualcomm had a system for truck trailer, trailer tracks, it was called a long time ago, but I never found out how it worked. That one's GPS based. That was one of their first products. Yeah, but I don't know how it was read. I mean, I, I think it had some, I don't know what the connection was to the outside world. I think it connected to Omnitrax, but I don't remember how. I never anyway. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I did a lot of RFID in my day. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the live stream at this point.